everyone. My name is Adam Williams, and you are listening to Retail Redeveloped. I am very, very excited right now to be joined by Mark Toro. He is a managing partner with North American Properties, one of the most dynamic retail developers on the East Coast. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Good morning, Adam. Uh, so, Mark, before we get in and, and really start nerding out on um, your projects and retail at large, would you do everybody a favor, if they're not familiar with, with who you are and what you do, would you tell everybody kind of who you are, what you do, and then just spend a quick minute telling everybody you know, how, you, how you came to sit in the chair that you're in right now and, and how you became you know, a retail nerd like I am? All right. So um, just a quick history on North American Properties. We are a 65-year-old company um, founded in Cincinnati. I founded the Atlanta office in 96 after a career in beginning a career in retail development uh, with Cousins and Faison and a number of other sort of household names throughout the Southeast. Um, I started my career in the construction business and was sort of snatched out of that to, to run um, – construction for a, a retail developer actually out of Cleveland called Zaremba um, in, uh, I won't tell you when, but a long time ago, um, and uh, was building shopping centers up and down the east, eastern seaboard, uh, recruited to New Market, which was then acquired by Cousins, and then ran the phase in office here in Atlanta, um, was recruited to open the North American Properties Office in 96. Um, my... Um, so about my degrees in civil engineering, my background is in construction. The real estate piece was something that I kind of learned, picked up along the way, and then started to you know, develop, I guess, a capability or at least a, an interest in all things real estate, from marketing and finance to construction to design and so forth. Um, the, the the fact that we are now engaged in a, yet another generation of commercial real estate and specifically retail, um, is related to uh, essentially the Great Recession. So in the pre-recession and what we call NAPA, NA North American Properties Atlanta, NAPA 1.0, um, we were building uh, large power centers in the suburbs. So um, Seminole Town Center in, in Orlando, 750,000 square foot of square feet of super target anchored um, uh, power Center, um, um, around North Point Mall in Atlanta, and, and all, essentially all over the Southeast. And um, in the Great Recession, we concluded, I concluded that um, because I was essentially alone at the time, we had essentially, we had uh, pared down the company from 45 or 50 people to four, and not a lot for us to do. So we didn't spend a lot of time in the office. I spent a lot of time on the couch imagining if I was ever going to put a shovel in the ground again. Um and read two, I think, or three maybe, three seminal volumes, right? One was The Great Reset, which spoke to the urbanization of America and the rise of a, um, a renter-by-choice class, right, in multifamily residential. Um, the second was a book by a friend of mine named Doug Stevens called Retail Revival. Uh, and the third... Uh, it was by another friend of mine named Joe Pine uh, and Jim Gilmore um, called um, the the experience economy, and knitting all three of those together concluded that we were no longer going to build shopping centers in the suburbs where people built stores that sold stuff, um, and it was no longer um, adequate for us to be a landlord that we collect rent and sweep the parking lot and change the light bulbs. Um, that we were, we, it was incumbent upon us as as real estate product providers to boil it all down to create an experience. And the and the fact that our product is no longer bricks and mortar, it's no longer a demised premise for a retailer. It is to drive business to that retailer by creating an experience for their customer, their customer being our guest. They're, they are our customer. Their customer is our guest. And in the um, winter of 2000, well, it was the fall of 2010, we were awarded the opportunity to acquire a beleaguered 
uh, mixed-use property in Atlanta called Atlantic Station. Um, it was on its heels in a flat spin, and um, we had an opportunity to use it as our, our living lab to deploy what we learned during the recession that, you know, we, we were in now in the, in the business of, of, of creating experiences. And what we learned through that process, through observation, not it wasn't a proactive approach. Um, we are actually creating community. And the, the spaces between the buildings became more important than the buildings. So we um, went on tour nationally, you know, probably 15 or 16 properties, um, looked at retail-dominant mixed-use properties that were um, market leaders in sales per square foot, you know, the typical metrics, right? Um, and then we started imagining what, how you could measure experiences per square foot and, you know, smiles, smiles per day and those kinds of things. And um, we came away with two models. Um, Colin, uh, I'm sorry, um, Santana Row in San Jose and the Grove in L.A., Santana Row for the physical plant and its incorporation of multifamily residential office and hotel into a retail dominant streetscape. And the Grove, which is all retail, um, its sister property, um, Americana brand has, has other uh, components. But um, both of those properties uh, by Caruso lead the industry in hospitality and service in a retail environment. So you have the physical plant of, of Santana Row and the um, operational prowess of the Caruso uh, team at Americana and, and the Grove. And our goal was to blend those two. So we used Atlantic Station, which we the physical plant was already constructed. And we didn't lay a single brick, but we signed something like 34 new leases and, and drove um, sales per square foot more than $100 per on average um, and really invigorated and, and re rescue maybe a, a strong word, but really sort of um, redefine that property to the community. Um, at the same time, this is the summer of 2011, we acquired out of foreclosure um, the property that is now Avalon. And um, Prospect Park was the name of that property that was uh, attempted by a local developer, failed during the recession, uh, was foreclosed. We bought it out of foreclosure. And, and using Aval Atlantic Station as our kind of living lab to, to test out the, the concepts of service and hospitality in a retail environment. So it's valet and concierge and music and lighting and um, events and activations and social media and, and guest interaction. Um, we built Avalon to house all of those experiences in order to drive retail sales. And it worked. So, um, you know, what you see, well, one of the things that I focused on in, in Doug Stevens' book, Retail Revival, is that he predicted, and this was probably in, well, it was in 2010, uh, nine, actually. Um, he predicted that there would be, that the, that the retail world would be barbelled, right? So you'd have the far end of convenience and, and frictionless um, acquisition of stuff, right? So you had Target and Walmart and Amazon and all of the e-commerce brands that have, that have now um, uh, proliferated. And on the far end, the opposite end, you have um, the high-touch animated experience. So you had the automated and the animated and that everything in between would get crushed. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing B and C malls, department stores, um, power centers, um, many of the retail formats that had served America well prior to uh, e-commerce are really, really struggling. And they will continue to, and there will, that, that my, my prediction is that that decline will, will continue and become even more rapid. 
as the so be, it's it's become sort of a, a a case of the haves and the have-nots. So in a in a retail environment where many stores are closing, arguably there are lots that are still opening, but they're only opening in those formats that are the haves, right? So Avalon, um, we have we have apparel retailers that are doing north of $1,000 a square foot. We have one that's doing $1,700 a square foot. All of our F&B is averaged more than $1,000 a square foot. Every time we have a retailer who goes out, as an example, Calypso St. Bart, BCBG, Gymboree, a handful of others have essentially gone out of business nationally. We, they handed our store back and we had a, a line of replacement tenants. Um, most of them are paying double, if not triple, the rent that the first generation tenant was paying. And they're doing so based on the sales per square foot that is being experienced across the property. And my, my supposition is that those sales per square foot are being driven by that guest experience. They're being driven by the community that has been created there. Because we now have loyal community members that are that are relating one on one with shopkeepers like they did in the you know in our, our grandparents' times, um, and and they are uh, they the, the the merchants notwithstanding the fact that many of them are almost all of them are national retailers, and which by the way almost none of the F and B operators are national. Uh, we we. We made we made a concerted effort to to have a very stable soft goods lineup, but a very entrepreneurial, um, local, a very overused term, chef driven um, F and B lineup, so that they were um, they were heart and soul. They were they had they they started forging direct personal relationships. You layer that with our um, digital media team, which is arguably creating a personal relationship with tens of thousands of people on a daily basis by touching them on social media, an events team that hosts 200 events a year, everything from uh, something we call Little Acorns, which is essentially Mother's Morning Out, and comedy shows, and concerts, and ice skating, and um, fat, uh, uh charity uh, fashion shows and those kinds of things um, that is they're essentially using our property to bring the community onto the property and hold them. And it's all about, and this is a, a, a concept we learned from Caruso. It's all about dwell time. It's about bringing people onto the property, holding them there and not forcing them, but they're there. The, the byproduct is that they shop. So, so we, we have the opportunity to combat e-commerce and the, the convenience that's inherent in, in a digital uh, you know, sales platform um, by providing the opportunity for people to get what they need and want, and that's community. And we spend so much time on our devices looking at our phones, and we're arguably the most well-connected uh, civilization in the history of man with text and Snapchat and Instagram and email and anything and everything. We hold it in our hand 24 seven yet. What we're craving is human interaction. And that is what has ha happened at Atlantic station at first. And we observed the whole idea of creating community. And then we amped it up at Avalon and we're in the process of creating Avalon in the city in a much urban, more urban environment at Colony Square by carving out public realm that we will activate or just offer to the community to come and gather and sort of have ad hoc uh, interactions. Um, and that has now proven to drive sales and drive value. Um, it's a very, very heavy lift. So that we've got, we've got people um, on our teams now, titles in our, org chart that didn't exist in the retail world um, before, you know, concierge and digital media strategists and community managers and events um, uh, 
specialists and so forth. Um, and, and that is what's driving the success of our properties. And that's what is, I believe, is going to drive retail in the future. Absent that guest experience and that opportunity to build community, um, e-commerce will condition, continue to eat retail. So I think this is as quiet as I've been in a long time for, for that length of time. Uh, my wife could would probably love to, to know how to keep me quiet for 12 or 13 minutes at a, at a clip. Um, so that's, that's a pretty impressive feat by itself. Um, and it makes me want to ask you a couple questions. I, I literally probably wrote down 10 questions while you were talking because there's a lot of value there. But the first thing that I want to ask you about, you mentioned you know, when a lot of other people were, you know, licking their wounds uh, from a development standpoint, uh, you took the time to try to reinvent, to try to learn from the mistakes you were seeing and try to reinvent yourself. Um, I wrote down all three of those those books that, that you mentioned, and I'm going to look them up because I haven't read any of them, I'm, I'm ashamed to say. Are there any new books that you're reading now that you think have kind of doubled down or continued to unpack or explore those three books, or are there any people that you follow uh, that you read, maybe you read on Forbes or, or somewhere else that you think have really catalyzed some of these ideas uh, that, that you think are important that people should be paying attention to? So I, I mentioned my friend Doug Stevens. Uh, he's from Toronto, um, is, is on the national, international speaker circuit uh, relative to the, the, um, the challenges that retail is facing speaks to any number of groups. He was the, the keynote speaker at ICS in New York last year. Um, exceptionally well versed and up to the minute. He is he is working to um, articulate the challenges and opine as to the solutions in retail in real time. So his second book is called Reengineering Retail. Um, and it is, it goes, it takes the next step, uh, speaking specifically to, um, the challenges of e-commerce and creating experiences and, and other types of things. Um, and then I, I, I think following, um, I'm an avid, uh, Twitter user and, and following, uh, threads that reveal others who have opinions. I mean, I'm, I'm always interested in learning. I read, of course, all the the, the trades, but um, I'm interested in learning from kind of people out there in the field, not journalists necessarily, um, people like yourself who are in in the flow every day and yet are are creating thought leadership platforms for the retail industry, the commercial real estate industry, the hospitality industry. Um, I serve on. Um, a ULI council called Urban Development Mixed Use. And there are a number of uh, thought leaders uh, in my council. And it's interesting, there are, I think, four or five developers on my council, and, and many of the others are in, in various other aspects of the business. And one of the guys on our on our uh, council is, is runs a big uh, private equity fund. And he was the one that articulated the fact that what we're witnessing today is the merger of all of the convergence, I'm sorry, of all of the commercial real estate uses absent industrial in one space, and that is hospitality. So the amenities race in multifamily residential and in single family residential, um, the, the um, Hotels have been in this business, obviously, but they, they define the hospitality industry. But hotels are amping up their offering to, to get into co-working, right? So there's a, a convergence. Um, office, uh, office landlords are, um, are now finally getting the memo that in order to compete uh, in this battle, this war for talent, they've got to provide an experience in not necessarily in their space, but outside their front door. So either they're going to locate in a transit rich urban uh, location where the next generation of knowledge workers is going to seek to spend their days, or they're going to locate as the case was the case at Avalon with 
Microsoft and Crown Castle and Access Insurance and many, many others who have who are paying buckhead rents in Alpharetta because they know that in order to recruit the best and the brightest, recruit, retain, and engage that, that next uh, you know, group of employees, they've got to provide uh, an environment that's not just building out their space in a ping pong table and a, and a slide. They, they've got to be able to put their office space in that environment. So you have office, and then um, then the last is retail. And, and retail, um, you know, you start seeing services provided um, at, um, at the, the Caruso's and the North Americans of the world that from a concierge perspective and a, uh, you know, we, we, we put, we sent our leadership team through training with Ritz Carlton leadership center, uh, when we first developed Avalon and we now teach the tenants of service and hospitality, just like you would in a hotel. So at, uh, I guess it's probably maybe 10 AM and 5 PM. Uh, we have a lineup like you have in a hotel where security, um, housekeeping, um, uh, valet, you know, all the service providers, many of them are third parties, by the way, are trained and are, uh, you know, uh, briefed on a daily basis on what's going to happen in our property that day. If there's a VIP on the property. Everybody on that property knows who that VIP is, when they're arriving, what their business is, and why they need to have you know special treatment. So that's the kind of thing you see in a five-star hotel, and you're now seeing it in office buildings, you're seeing it in apartment buildings, and you're seeing it in uh, retail environments. And that that's the, the you know there there are key learning things you pick up along the way. When when that gentleman said that in the in the um, in my ULI council, I'm like, yes. I, I mean, I just had not. Hard, it had not been articulated that way. Well, and there's exactly. no way to there's no way to fake that either. You know, you're not just going to wake up one day and 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 try to implement that. It takes a lot of a lot of you know forethought and and training to to be able to pull off that level of hospitality. So, Mark, I, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. Go back to a couple of things that you spoke about earlier. I want to talk about metrics that were maybe important um, a little while ago but aren't quite as important now or metrics that have changed significantly uh, over the last few years. And I want to talk about the, the new guard of retail that might be impressing you. You mentioned, you know, the Jim Brees of the world closing shop and uh, there, there are kind of new fresh people that are, that are hitting you. I'd love for you to talk about either what about these new guys impresses you or maybe narrow down on specific retailers that are, that are new to the market, maybe the direct to consumer, maybe they're just new to brick and mortar, but some of these guys that are impressing you and, and why? Well, I think that the newcomers to the marketplace are to a great extent digitally native brands that are um, seeking to um, bolster their profitability by going to bricks and mortar. Um, and we are, um, we're researching and talking to those digitally native brands on a daily basis. Um, we, we actually have, have one of the, the early ones, Bonobos at Avalon, um, that is um, doing great sales. And we're talking to a number of others, the Warby Parkers of the world and others. Um, but the, 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 if you look at, there are how many athleisure players that are, that are, uh, new beyond uh, uh, Lulu and Athleta that are um, still proving themselves. So I, I don't know that we know uh, yet who the winners and losers are going to be. Um, I know that many of these um, these are, are crowded fields. And much like when we were in the big box business and we had three players in a category, we were pretty confident one was going to shake out, if not both. Um, I think about Office Max, Office Depot, and Staples, right? There, you know, there, there was just not room for all of them. So I, I, don't, I don't purport to be an expert in it, but I'm, I'm learning and, and listening and watching. What about metrics? Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about the halo effect where 
you know, obviously, let's let's just use Warby Parker because it's the one that everybody knows. I mean, they're they're selling online. These digitally native brands have in their DNA a very very strong kind of data analyzation and consumption uh, streak in their in their actual DNA. So they know that uh, you know my my zip code where I'm sitting right now two eight two zero two. You know, we know that there are a bunch of Warby Parker customers that are already living there, and we know that if we drop a store there, we're going to have some success. Uh, and then when that, when that store opens, the online sales also go up. So this halo effect is fascinating to me. Are there any other metrics that you're hearing a lot that are standing out to you that you think will be really important uh, moving forward that maybe we weren't even thinking about two or three years ago? Well, I mentioned one earlier, and that's dwell time. I, I think to the extent that we have a guest on the property and we keep them there, um, that will inure to the benefit of, of our retailers. And our, our job as a landlord is to drive their sales, because if they fail, we fail. Um, you know, there's the classic sales for square foot and comp store sales and all those uh, that, that will still be required in order to especially for these large public companies in order to gauge the, the relative performance of their various units. Um, I think we're, we're still trying to figure out how to quantify um, other than um, as, as an example, uh, when we host a large event, in fact, Sunday this week, um, we have what we call the lighting of Avalon. And during that day, 15,000 people will come and go, uh, many of them staying for the crescendo when Santa arrives and we light the tree and the fireworks and all that. And and we know that days like that, big event days, we drive lots of F&B sales. Um, we also know that it impacts, in some cases, negatively on some specific retailers uh, who um, are, are, I'll call it, you know, they're they're not in the flow of the of the event. Um, the um, the other kinds of events that we host on a daily, weekly basis basis it's you know either it's yoga or Mother's Morning Out or comedy or whatever. We gauge how those events um, impact our retailer sales. We talk to them every week about how did how did um, Little Acorns do for you if you're a you know, if you are a um, Jamie and Jack, as an example, you know, a, a retailer that caters to the young moms. Um, so, so we're constantly talking to our retailers, even many of them long before they open, about what it is that is going to drive your sales and how we can assist with that. They, each of them, many of them now, and especially these digitally native brands have tremendous online presence and social media presence. Um, you know, we, we look at, at we're, we're interested in how many Instagram followers a specific brand has and how their Instagram sales platform is performing because that's what's driving. You know, we, we built Avalon for Instagram. There are many of the, the places and the moments and the designs, the elements and the orientations that are specifically designed for people to share their life online with their friends from our property. So we, we talk, we look at online impressions, uh, both for our outreach on, on behalf of our retailers. And if we have a, a, I can always tell uh, as I watch our Instagram feed, who our marketing team is seeking to promote um, sales for. So if you're um, Jay McLaughlin or Janie and Jack or free people and you come to our marketing team and say, hey, we're having a slow month or we want to promote this we're not a special because we don't do those kinds of things. Um, we, we have uh, uh, influencers that we've brought in onto the property. Uh, we do a, um, uh, a series with um, fashion bloggers that – come onto the property and do, um, as an example, there's one right now on Avalon called Dressing Room Diaries. And there's a, um, an influencer, a fashion blogger named City Peach that comes in. And this week I was flipping through our Instagram feed and, and she was she spent the day trying on clothes at Madewell. And that 
that's a relationship that our marketing team has with that retailer that um, they will come to us and say, hey, I need to, I need a boost. Can you help me out? So I can always tell. And, and then the metrics that we're looking for in that aspect are impressions or clicks or followers or responses or likes or something um, so that we can, we can gauge how well we're performing on behalf of our retailer to drive sales. You know, I, I had this conversation about kind of Instagrammable moments um, a lot when I talk to retailers and when I talk to developers. I'd love to hear from you to, to know how that's changed because I, for some reason, I have it in my head that there's always been Instagrammable moments even before Instagram. It was just called really thoughtful design, right? Attention getting thorough plan design. And now the buzzword is obviously Instagram moments. Do you think it's just, it's changed the way people design things or do you think that it's more, it's just getting played up a little bit more? What, what is your thought there? No, I think it's real. I mean, the, 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 as an example, there are, there have been 68 marriage proposals at Avalon since we opened five years ago. 68? So, 12, 68. 68 young men have come to our concierge team. And those are the ones we know about, right? Have come to our concierge team and they said, I want to stage my engagement with my girlfriend and I want you to facilitate it. And it's either going to be on the ice skating rink or it'll be in a plaza or it'll be wherever. Um, and, and the, and the entire thing is staged for Instagram. And, and we believe that people are living their lives online and sharing with their friends and their neighbors. Um, the, the fact that they're, you know, living the high life, if you will, uh, and that these are physically attractive, vibrant backgrounds in order to live your life. And we, um, it's a real thing. I mean, it, 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 it really drives, um, and if you, if you go to um, Instagram and just click on Avalon as a place, as opposed to the handle, um, you'll see that on any given day, there are hundreds of people who choose to promote the fact that they're at Avalon living their life. That's so cool. And that, dri that drives community. So I want to talk, I want to go back to something else you mentioned, which is kind of how mixed use is the future, you know, as you know, new urbanism continues to evolve and how, you know, everybody wants this, you know, live, work, play environment. I mean, that I don't think that's going anywhere anytime soon. I want, I would love to hear your thoughts on the actual, you call it the physical plant, like the actual sticks and bricks of how you scale mixed use with retail on the ground floor. And, and I go back to a conversation I had with the director of real estate for design within reach a few months ago that, that sticks with me. We were looking at a project that I really liked for them and it was apartments above retail. And he literally looked at it and it was, it actually saved us a lot of time because it was a quick no instead of, you know, doing the machinations of the meetings and the LOIs. He was like, no, my brand is too compressed there. You know, we've got this small bay, we've got five stories of, of residential above, very monolithic, and my, my brand is going to feel compressed and strained and, and it's not going to deliver the brand experience that I want. So how, as a developer, do you consciously try to keep that from happening and, and let the retailers kind of shine, but still have the, the density and scale that you need to perform on, you know, extremely expensive urban sites? So not only do we let them um, express themselves, we encourage them to. So on uh, during the, the design development at Avalon and now here at Colony Square, um, we, in fact, we just had a, a meeting right before this call about um, a, with a, with a uh, entertainment concept that is, um, well, it's, it's IPEC, you know, the theaters. So they've, they've recently re, um, uh, reorganized 
they're opening a, a, a um, theater here in September of next year. And we sat down with them and talked through how we can help them express their brand. How can we begin right now, um, less than a, a little less than a year away, um, banging the drum, assuring that when they they um, start the, when they present their first film, that the community is is ready for you know is is, is, is anticipating. So um, that interaction is as much about their F and B concept, their um, physical presentation, their brand expression. So if you look at Avalon as an example, free people and Anthro and Lulu and Brooks Brothers and Apple and each one of them is expresses their brand in in to the nth degree because we we have no um, the the building elements from above. So we got five stories of Resi on one, four on another, office building on another. You know, all, all kinds of different uh, uses above a hotel on another. Um, they, we provide them with a blank slate. There's a slab above that houses the use above, and it's literally wide open. So when when we would, we would sit, when we still do sit in Monday morning meetings, and our tenant coordination team takes the designs, the storefront designs that have been suggested um, by retailer X, Y, or Z, or restaurant tour and we'll work through it with them and and invariably we're we're actually pulling pushing them to be more vivid with their brand expression um, because we believe that's what i mean if you <laughs> think about it uh, retail uh, uh, residential above retail people living above the store wait where have i seen that before oh i know in real cities <laughs> for 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 forever decade, for, yeah. for millennia Forever, right? Since since this since they had multi-story buildings, that's the way it's been. So, um, but in in cities, you see brand, you see buildings, high-rise office buildings, and whatever else that um, have very retail spaces. That, that could be a twenty-foot storefront, but it ha- it's the opportunity for that retailer to express their brand to that um, to that streetscape. And to draw people in, and that if you if you've been to Avalon, you you can you'll see that each and every storefront is specifically designed to get that brand and put them in the in the mind's eye in the in the eye of the consumer. So I, I love how much you concentrate on expressing um, the community and, and getting people involved. I'd love to hear how else you guys are are trying to keep from you know, falling into that mall trap. Obviously, you know, it was 15 years ago, it was all indoor big malls. You mentioned Henry Faison and, and you know, the other guys, uh, the CBLs of the world mm-hmm. that, that built these things and stamped them out all, all over the country. How do you guys, I'd love to hear in your mind why there was such a sudden shift to the lifestyle center model as opposed to the indoor mall. And then how do you guys keep your merchandising fresh uh, you mentioned, you know, solid national retailer, you know, cutting edge uh, food and beverage on the, kind of a local entrepreneurial level, Level, which uh, we talked about Adam Schwegman before we started recording. I know that's a huge passion of his. Um, how, do you, how do you do all those things and not fall into that, that mall trap? Well, first of all, it comes from the DNA of our company, and that is that we're, A, we're not, we're not mall developers, and we believe that generally, other than fortress malls, malls are failing. And it, and it is a concept and a format that is no longer embraced by the American consumer um, and will continue to decline. So it's real easy not to chase that rainbow because we think that rainbow comes to an abrupt end. Um, the other thing is that we are, our leadership in the operations side are almost in fact, I'm trying to think of uh, our operations and marketing and our experience makers, as we call them. By the way, we trademark that phrase, experience maker, cap E, cap M, one word. Um, 
to to demonstrate, to essentially to articulate what it is the business that we're in. So none of our experience makers are come from retail backgrounds. We actually had a few failed attempts at general managers who came from large mall developers and owners and didn't quite get what we were about. We would spend a lot of time at Santana Row. We spent a lot of time at the Grove and we um, essentially, you know, knock off Caruso and, and, and uh, federal and, um, our teams were unable to execute because they just didn't think that way. So um, there's a lady named Anila Respress who runs our um, operations currently, um, who is a Four Seasons 15-year veteran, uh, steeped in hospitality, um, born and raised in Germany, uh, an exceptional talent in, in the service side of our business. And that is the way she sees her role in, in providing that guest experience and building community. It has nothing to do with retail. Um, we do have our, our director of marketing, uh, Kelly Mullen, is, um, is, had experience at Nordstrom, but as a retailer, not as a retail landlord. So, so one of the key factors in, in deploying our, our, um, our, program, uh, you know, our concept is to not think like a retailer, right. to not think like a retail landlord, not think like a mall owner. So what else? I mean, obviously Avalon, you know, people have flown there from all over the world, um, certainly all over the country, all over the world to see what you guys have done and what is your special sauce. Um, I'd love to hear kind of what else you guys, you know, what has you excited now? Obviously Avalon is, it consumes a lot of time, but but what's next for your team? What gets you excited about a new project or a new market? Um, and just just tell me a little bit about what else we should we should expect from from you and your team moving forward. Well, I think that the um, Colony Square is uh, we're, we call it Avalon in the city. It's the opportunity to create um, that community uh, in an urban setting. It's it's Midtown's living room. Uh, it's by far the most um, robust urban retail um, environment. And I, I, I use retail very, very loosely there because it's very heavily F&B and service and entertainment. Um, but the idea is to provide what it is that Midtown needs. I, I have a unique situation that I live a block away so <laughs> and have for 10 years, so I, I recognize what, what is required here. Um, the... The other piece I think that's intriguing to us, in addition to other um, ground-up opportunities, is the opportunity, much as we did with Atlantic Station, to acquire either mixed-use or retail environments that can be mixed-use, that can be refit to mixed-use, in very strong markets that uh, are, I would call, more value-add. Um, so our, our acquisitions program that, that began with the acquisition of Colony Square, I'm sorry, Atlantic Station in 2010, um, is, is now sort of ramping up, looking at, um, I wouldn't say distress, but neglected uh, properties that had, that had been in the hands of, of pure play um, real estate managers. Um, so often third parties for institutions that really didn't come from the perspective that we do. You know, it's not, not about hospitality and service to them. It's about sweeping the parking lot and collecting the rent. And um, we think we can make a difference there. So that, that is what's next, a, a, a value add acquisitions program where we think we can take our secret sauce and slather it all over an otherwise really well-positioned property. Yeah, I can't wait to see what else you guys have. And my mind is is spinning just thinking about opportunities that I've seen that that you guys uh, could be a kind of a missing ingredient. It reminds me a lot, you know, on a different scale of what Asana is doing um, on kind of brick and beam retail in a, in a lot of markets right now. Coming in, looking at things uh-huh. with, a, with a much different lens. Uh, I've sold them a lot of stuff in town 
where people thought they were overpaying and they bought something with 10 and 12 and $14 rents. And then we come back in and do a deal with them at 45 or 50. And, and then people start to nod their heads and get it a little bit more. Yeah. Well, there, when we did Avalon and even when we did Atlantic station, we had a lot of naysayers, uh, who are now, uh, drinking the Kool-Aid. This, this, and, it, well, I mean, to the extent that we've created, we've demonstrated that there's value. I mean, we, we now, now know from a dollars and cents perspective what this is worth. Well, Mark, you've been so gracious with your time. I know how busy you are. Um, I'd love to hear any kind of parting shots you have for other retail nerds um, that are that are listening to you and, and following the same kind of things that you're following. And then please tell everybody how to connect with with you or your brand or your projects. Uh, let let people know how they can kind of follow what you guys are doing. Um, okay, so um, parting shots. I, I would say that uh, all of us, me included, uh, should continue to seek to reinvent ourselves each and every day because this is a moving train that we're stepping onto. And I think it's really critical that we um, recognize that we don't know what we don't know, that it is moving at a pace that none of us really comprehend. Um, and that if you consider yourself an expert, you're wrong. Um, you know, none of us, uh, if, and we have a saying: if you if you if you believe yourself to be the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Um, That's and, great and advice. And we we got to we have got to con- we have got to continue learning, and that's why um, back to where to find us. Um, I spent a lot of time on on Twitter uh, following specifically thought leaders in this space. I don't care what Kim Kardashian had for breakfast. You know, I, I don't follow anything remotely political it's own it's all about urban development um retail commercial real estate and transit and that's all i focus on so if you follow me on twitter mark toro at mark toro um there's that's what you'll find uh and you'll find me um sort of shamelessly promoting our properties as well because that's my job but um the the uh, each of our properties um, is um, is active in on social media. So Avalon is Avalon Insider, Calling Square is Calling Square ATL. Um, new newly uh, acquired property in Cincinnati uh, called Newport on the Levee um, that that fits that that box that I just mentioned. The value add acquisition. Um, of a neglected property that has tremendous potential that we will be um, generously slathering with our secret sauce. Um, and that's uh, at Newport and Levy on Instagram and Twitter. And um, Instagram is kind of our weapon of choice. My my Instagram is not it's Mark C Toro, but um, that uh, that that's kind of my personal channel as well because I have now four grandchildren and I serve on four nonprofit boards, so I talk a lot about things that are not commercial real estate there, but, uh, every once in a while I'll, I'll pimp something that we're doing that is, uh, exciting, like the lighting of Avalon on Sunday. Very, very cool. Well, Mark, um, I just so want, that's, that's kind of it. I just want to take a second and, and acknowledge you for coming on and, and sharing, you know, a lot of wisdom with, with our listeners. I, I learned a ton. I've got two pages of notes here and I've got new books to read and a couple new people to follow. So I just want to take a second and say thank you for, for coming on and, and, and sharing that with us. Sure enough, Adam, I appreciate it. You have a great, happy Thanksgiving and um, have a great holiday season. Absolutely.